All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Brooklyn Aquarium Society live stream. This is David, otherwise known as D, because there's so many Daves in the world. <laughs> Common like the clownfish. I'm here with tonight's special guest, a warm welcome, one and only Mr. Todd Gardner, who has spoken at our club several times. And I often go back and rewatch and re-listen to those presentations because I always have another question. Like, I always have another question. It's odd. You never get to be an expert in this hobby. I don't believe in the word expert when it comes to uh, keeping fish and plants and these animals that we care so much about alive, but um, very knowledgeable person. So I know you guys are going to like the presentation tonight and I want to welcome and thank you all for coming in. Um, Brooklyn Aquarium Society, one of the oldest aquarium organizations in the U.S. Getting ready to reach our birthday again next month. I'm going to post a lot of historical information that I have pulled up from the Brooklyn Aquarium Society archives to post on our uh, YouTube fun fact channel that I'm coming up with, as well as our Facebook page. So you guys want to look out for that. Um, another thing I want to talk about is the meeting. We are almost 99% set up to do an in-person meeting. I do not even want to put the whammy on it. Stay tuned. If you're not already a subscriber to the Facebook page or the YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now. We're looking to have an in-person meeting next month. We're really, 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 really looking forward to getting uh, that in-person um, aspect of the club going again. But as we all know, there have been quite a few obstacles. So I'm hoping that we can get that set up and squared away for next month, March's um, second Friday of the month. So stay tuned in for that. Um, as well as membership, there's going to be membership promotion going out in the next few weeks as well. Um, without rambling too much, <laughs> and I'm easily the rambler, um, I'm going to talk to you about Mr. Todd Gardner here, professor of aquaculture. I always say agriculture, and I know aquaculture at um, Carteret, 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 Carteret College in North Carolina, right? Yes. If I'm mistaken. Um, a wealth of information and breeder of over 50, I'm sure maybe even more than that, 50 or more species that I've heard in previous presentations. Saltwater fish, freshwater fish, just a lot going into aquaculture and, in and, and my opinion, saving the hobby. So uh, without rambling too much, I want to welcome Mr. Todd Gardner here. Hey, Todd. Hi, D. Thank you so much. That was very nice. Um, it's it's nice to be back. I think this is my second virtual lecture for Brooklyn Aquarium Society. I don't even remember what my topic was last time. but uh, And so I apologize if I repeat too many of the things I talked about last time. But this is a, a new take uh, to some extent. But uh, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this about my very first Brooklyn Aquarium Society talk and realizing it makes me feel old, but I think my first lecture for the Brooklyn Aquarium Society in the education hall there on Coney Island was 23 years ago. Um, time flies when you're having fun. It sure does. <laughs> Look, you see all this gray? I didn't have gray the last time <laughs> I think you spoke. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and I've... Uh, been there so many times since both as a member and uh, as a speaker and uh, it I have to say it doesn't it just doesn't feel the same without getting my Entenmann's donut at the start of the <laughs> meeting there's always a whole bunch of boxes of Entenmann's donuts in the back of the room and a little cup of coffee um, our vice president uh we spoke today and she's like, oh, for a virtual meeting, maybe I should put some donuts on the side to make people feel at home. <laughs> that would be so funny. <laughs> Hopefully we can get those intimates next month. I mean, we've been working, we've been working with the aquarium, you know, partners over the last, I know we've been meeting at the education hall way before I've been a member, at least 50 years from what I've seen, probably more than that. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to touch upon. You know, you've been working in the industry a long time and aquaculture with the closure of so many aquatic sources for fish and, and wildlife in the last year or so. Um, the, the emphasis on what we do as hobbyists in aquaculture and where we get the animals from and, 
and how we take care of the environment in which we collect and and give back to is is our main staple of conversation these days. So I know there's going to be a lot of questions. And since our last presentation, a lot has changed, man. And I think you've contributed a lot of positive to just the captive breeding of fish in the last few years have been like groundbreaking from when I, I've been in the hobby a good 40 years, not a lot. And when I say it, I feel kind of old, but um, just, I remember when there were no clownfish in the hobby and now we have so many species of just that fish by itself that it's it's mind blowing. Yeah, and and that's uh, that's really kind of the the topic of tonight's talk is is how aquaculture has shaped the hobby and and how our interests in the hobby also have shaped aquaculture and and uh, how far we've come and and where I guess we're going and and obviously the some of this latest legislation is. Uh, on everyone's mind right now and it's it's got us a little scared as it always does so i'll try to touch on that a little bit too not not that i'm fully up to speed on it but uh but i i, I will address that to some extent um i uh typically start out talking giving a little bit of background uh about aquaculture technology and uh and i'll i'll do that again tonight but um I, so much of the the early stages of marine ornamental aquaculture, because it really started way after uh, the advent of freshwater aquarium aquaculture. Um, a lot of it centered around the foods that were available to us, the live foods that were available for the larval fish. Unlike freshwater mm -hmm. fish, so many marine species have a very small larval stage. Um, and for a long time, um, for, for a long time, all we had was artemia. Uh, that was that was our one live food in the whole industry, and uh, and then this this other one showed up, the rotifer. Um, and and just like with the fish that we end up culturing, uh, often it's shaped by their life cycle, and and mm -hmm. you know it's like uh, just like uh, anything else we do, whether it's listening to music, it's, it's shaped by the convenience, you know, we've given up so much in sound quality for the convenience of, of the music files we listen to today. Um, I still love my deep, my CDs yeah. and albums. I tell you, my, me too. My, my but, wife calls me old, but there's nothing like an album, the sound that comes off an album. For, uh, for so long, we were restricted only to fish that we could raise using Artemia brine shrimp because mm -hmm. they were just so convenient. And, and for so long, so many of the fish we raised were, um, we were restricted to fish that were convenient to raise. Um, and uh, we went on for 30 years of breeding marine fish without making any headway in that regard. I wanna mention again about the rotifer from it. The rotifer is a, a multi-celled animal that swims around in the water, um, but it's very small. It's one of the smallest multi-celled animals. It's uh, the size of a lot of protists you know it's it's smaller than a, than than uh your average paramecium which is a protist a single celled animal and so um the way that rotifers first came into aquaculture is a funny story i may have told it before sorry if i have but the uh although aquaculture itself we have records of it going back about 5000 years most people agree that aquaculture probably started closer to 10 to 12,000 years ago when we started with the rest of agriculture, when people started settling and, and growing things. Um, but the way the rotifer entered the scene goes back just a couple of hundred years. And again, uh, some of the first really intensive aquaculture was growing eels in Asia. And eels were a prized food and it was something about their life cycle, even though no one's really closed the life cycle of the eels of the Anguillidae family, the American eel and the, the other, you know, um, uh, diadromous eels that swim up into the rivers. Um, they've been cultured for a long time and it's a quirk of their life cycle that made them convenient to culture, which is that um, the adults would spawn out at sea and then the um, post-larvae would 
swim up into rivers and they would get these, you know, come in at these bottlenecks where they were very easy to collect by the millions. And they would collect massive numbers of these baby eels as they were swimming upstream and grow them up uh, to market size. And um, the way they would grow them is to put them out into ponds, sometimes in pens in ponds, but they, they put them in ponds and they would induce an algae bloom in the pond to help control water quality and to feed zooplankton that could be food for the eels. But rotifers first showed up um, accidentally in these ponds in huge numbers. They would get into such high densities that they would clear the algae out and, um, and, and just eat every bit of algae and outcompete all the other plankton. And they were regarded as a pest. And it wasn't until the 1970s that um, they found some really good uses for these rotifers. And uh, in the United States, rotifers were used to raise the first ever marine fish with a true larval stage. And that was the redfish or red drum. And this was done at the University of Texas. And it was only after that that um, Martin Moe, one of the pioneers of marine fish culture for the aquarium uh, industry, um, adopted that technology of, of raising these rotifers that could be raised in very, very high numbers. And, and, and getting back to the convenience of this animal, the rotifer, uh, another thing that made the rotifer such a suitable uh, plankton for growing is that they reproduce asexually using parthenogenesis. They're all females and they can produce eggs that develop without fertilization. And this cuts off part of the life cycle and allows them to reproduce very rapidly and in very, very high numbers. So um, with Artemia, what made them so convenient was that we could collect their dried eggs and hatch them on demand as many as we wanted. With rotifers, what made them so convenient is that uh, they were small and swam around and would reproduce and, and get themselves into such high concentrations that we could we have unlimited numbers of them to feed massive numbers of fish. So um, soon after um, Martin Moe got uh, into his um, production of clownfish, uh, Bill Addison, um, kind of on the heels of that, became friends with Martin Moe and built his own hatchery in Puerto Rico. Uh, and this is where I entered the scene. Uh, this was not until the 90s, but I um, met Bill through uh, old old fashioned mail, writing letters back and forth. And he invited me to come down to the hatchery. And I went there and, um, and, and uh, worked in this hatchery where now, now we're at this point, 20 years into clownfish culture. Now clownfish have become very widely cultured. Forrest uh, Young and Martin Moe together um, really honed the technology for raising clownfish. And then at the same time, um, tried to take on as many other marine species as they could. Uh, the problem was there weren't really any other great foods available. So they would, they would tackle species after species and try raising them using the same techniques as the clownfish um, and realize that so many marine species just won't survive as larvae um, using this rotifer artemia progression. They wouldn't even take rotifers either. They were too small to take the rotifers or the rotifers weren't nutritious enough or they weren't attractive enough. Um, so they took to using a lot of wild plankton to raise some of the more difficult species like angelfish um, and, and groupers and things. Um, but what, what ended up happening was for another 20 years after that, um, there wasn't a whole lot other than clownfish being produced. These are just some pictures of some of my old tanks at the Long Island Aquarium uh, where we were messing around with aquaculture. Um, but uh, during my time at Sequest and in the years following, uh, the, the main idea was to grow lots of clownfish, and then we added in a couple of other families. But for so many years, our, all of our efforts went into finding fish that were raisable using the same technology rather than developing new technology. 
Um, and so among those were gobies. We found lots and lots of fish in the goby family could be raised using the same technology. They just had a little bit of a longer larval stage. Um, I didn't put any dotty back pictures in here, but dotty backs were the other big family. So for a decade or so, it was basically clownfish and gobies and dotty backs were the only three families of fish being produced um, through aquaculture in the marine aquarium world. And we dabbled in some other things too. Uh, we raised some um, a few batches of Royal Gramas and decided they were too cheap and too much trouble to raise at that time. So we stopped. Um, we raised some seahorses and that was what my master's thesis was on. And we've had some good runs of raising lots and lots of seahorses. One of the big problems in um, aquaculture is when you, when you try to scale this up and do this on a factory scale and meet the whole market demand, which everyone is hoping, you know, back Back in the days of Aqualife and uh, and uh, Martin Mo uh, really moving ahead with this stuff, people had this idea that it was only going to be a few years before the entire industry was supplied on 100% aquacultured fish. And it was frustrating to find that not only could we not even come close to raising so many of them, but even the ones we could like Royal Gramas and seahorses, um, they either weren't valuable enough for all the trouble or um, more often the, the problem was that the techniques involved to raise them were just different enough from the standard clownfish model that it just didn't scale up nicely. Yet there were too many different things having to go on uh, in a hatchery um, and, you know, when, when you try and mass produce something, you need to try and have a, you know, a uniform streamlined process. And even though seahorses will start off on Artemia and will grow fast, there's just so much difference in the techniques for raising them and in the diseases and the parasites they get and in the space and the flow and the lighting that they need that, um, it, it's just hard to to mass produce clownfish and seahorses and royal gramas um, because there's you know there's just a lot of different technique involved. So now oh, that oh. that brings up a question. I'm going to jump in right there because yeah. there was a question posted, and I think you touched upon it. Um, somebody asked, "How long does it take for you to consistently breed a certain species, and like how long would you invest?" before you decide it's not going to happen. Like I know we've kept like, sometimes you kept, you can keep clownfish for months and months before you actually find that technique that develops a certain strain or like how much time did you invest in trying to breed a species? Well, that really, for me, I've had the luxury for a lot of my life, you know, right now, a big part of my livelihood is directly in, um, fish culture but for a lot of my life i i had um you know different i've 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 been able to raise fish for fun even when i worked at the aquarium and i was supposed to be raising fish as part of my job my main job was keeping nice exhibits and and raising fish was kind of a thing on the side and a hobby and, a dream as a as a uh, um you know college professor i've been able to raise fish either on the side or as a supplemental thing. And so I haven't had to lean on that as my primary livelihood for, for most of my life, but there have been a few years and, and it is, uh, you know, it's half of my income right now is, is uh, marine fish culture. Um, and so uh, it really depends on where you're at and why you're doing it. Hmm. But uh, there's definitely when you have the need to make it profitable, you have much less patience. <laughs> when you're doing it for fun, you have the luxury. I mean, I spent 15 years trying to raise the Lyapropoma, the Swiss Guard, and the Candy Bass, uh, and and uh, I took my time, you know. And in the end, I raised a very small number of them, um, but it was worth it, and I loved it. Uh, right now, I I wouldn't invest that much time and to, uh, who knows if I even have that much time left, <laughs> but I wouldn't invest that much time now, but I also have more tools. You don't uh, need to invest as much time 
today. Yeah, know-how has increased. The education has increased a lot. Yeah, I, I, I know more than I did back then. But but more importantly, I think I, I have tools at my disposal that I didn't have then. And um, one thing that came from this small selection of cultured fish is it started to change our um, perception of what makes a good tank and what makes a good um, tank inhabitant. And at the same time, as I, I was ignoring the whole coral reef tank revolution, but at the same time as we were forging ahead with all of this fish breeding stuff, the reef aquarium world was going in its own direction. These things were mm -hmm. happening simultaneously. And we watched, um, you know, it's amazing just going back to the 80s, what our idea of a beautiful marine fish tank looked like, or what our idea of um, suitable marine fish were to have in your tank. That's changed an awful lot. And it was shaped in part by the reef keeping revolution that um, brought about this idea of reef safe fish, having, having fish that uh, A, won't eat your corals and B, won't get too big and put out too much nitrogen for your corals and C, won't eat all the rest of your fish. And this was actually, um, this, this really helped and encouraged uh, the aquaculture industry because as it happened, the few fish that we were able to raise were mostly reef safe and stayed small. And now, you know, reef as, as the reef hobby developed, people were looking for smaller fish for their tanks. And, you know, when I got into the hobby, it was all trigger fish and big angels. And, and you know, people were keeping, putting big parrot fish in their tanks. And um, it, it's amazing the things we used to want to put in our tanks <laughs> that, that today we think would just be absurd. Um, what is that, a barracuda? That's a barracuda, yeah. I'm pretty sure I tried to put one of those. <laughs> oh, I've, I've kept dozens of them myself, of course. Um, but uh, we had this idea going back to the early days. We had this idea. We were watching what's happening in the food industry. Uh, the the orange graph below is showing uh, world capture fisheries for, for the food industry. Now we know we're putting out more and more boats and trying harder to catch more fish. So in spite of more effort, our catch of seafood has leveled off and maybe even is declining a little bit, but the overall consumption of fish continues to rise. And in the food industry, that difference is being met by aquaculture. And it's to the point now where more than half of the seafood that is consumed in the world comes from aquaculture. And that gap keeps growing, which is which is great. Uh, it's great for wild fisheries. And early on, we really expected aquaculture to take that same trend with um, aquarium fishes. But you know, as it turns out, so many of the fish that we eat, if you think about it, so many of the fish that we eat come from coastal waters, um, coastal and temperate areas where there's a lot of fluctuation in water quality, where fish tend to be hardier. Uh, they're brackish and freshwater species. We, we eat a ton of freshwater species and brackish species and coastal species. So those fish are hardy. A lot of them have no larval stages or very big larval stages, and they're easy to raise. Virtually everything in the marine aquarium hobby comes from coral reefs. And coral reefs, yeah, we think of them as being coastal, but in reality, they're oceanic. They're, they're situated far from big inputs of fresh water and runoff and, and continents. They're islands out in the ocean where water conditions are more stable and um, the diversity is higher. And they have those fish have had the evolutionary luxury of specializing on very specific foods unlike a fish that grows up in an estuary or a pond and has to just eat whatever's there. Um, fish in these very stable environments like coral reefs um, tend to be more delicate and more specialized. So they're more difficult to feed from their um, earliest larval stages all through adulthood. So it wasn't realistic uh, for us to think that we could so easily um, meet the market demand in um, in marine aquarium fish because of where they're from largely. 
But one of the greatest revolutions, and I, I, I have to bring this into every talk because I have to give people the credit that they're due. Um, I think the most important contribution, the thing that's catapulted us from clownfish and gobies to where we are today, and, and this is something we did realize 30 years ago that copepods were going to be the answer. Copepods are what most of those specialized fish are feeding on. They're the most nutritious things out there for larval fish. And um, we would, when, when we would raise fish using wild collected plankton, we would see that this is what they were eating. And we tried for a long time to find the right copepod that we could grow in high enough densities and grow easily enough and um, it was a huge challenge to isolate them from all the other plankton, one single species at a time and find the ideal one. And there were a number of people that um, worked on this, but I, I think uh, Eric Sten at Al Algagen really was the first one to isolate and commercialize two or three of the most important copepods that have allowed all of the breakthroughs that we've seen in the last decade in marine ornamental aquaculture. Uh, and Parvo Calanus, the one shown here, uh, really is the most important one. And now they've gotten out there and, and lots of people have them and lots of people are selling them. But, um, but he was the original one that got them out and made them available. And I think so many of the species that have been raised in captivity over the last 10 years are, were only possible because of that development. And um, so, and, and this brings us to, again, where, where we are basically today, we've seen groups like uh, Rising Tide at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab down in Florida have made incredible breakthroughs. Uh, things like butterfly fish, um, we thought, you know, back in the 90s and the early 2000s that that this was a family of fish we were just never going to be able to breed in captivity. Um, no one had ever gotten a larva you know, anywhere near uh, metamorphosis, you know, even through the very earliest days. So um, to see this developments like this has just been so exciting for me, you know, for the longest time, angelfish and butterfly fish and wrasses and um, and, and some of these other families that we love to keep, um, but that weren't clownfish and gobies and dottiebacks just seemed untouchable. They, and, and, you know, and, and if they ever were raised, it would have to be only using wild plankton. So the fact that we can raise fish like this with cultured plankton today is just amazing to me. Um, and that, and that brings us to tangs, tangs and butterfly fish. I've always thought were probably the two most impossible families of fish to culture. Um, and uh, back uh, a few years ago, when I saw biota hitting the news with the new species they were coming out with, I was just so thrilled and jealous, insanely jealous that they're getting these fish through that I could only ever dream of. Um, but it gave me so much respect for them and, um, and, and what they've done. And, um, going back to the evolution of, of the hobby going hand in hand with this uh, and, and the parallel um, developments going on in the reef keeping community, which I, I'm, not, I'm not really too much of a part of, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the fish world, but watching uh, from that tank of bleached corals we saw earlier <laughs> to you know, some of our ideas of what makes a, a nice fish tank today. And to see that you know, maybe these fish aren't captive bred, but to now know that, you know, the tangs at least could be. And uh, we don't look at tanks anymore as these sterile things where we put in a handful of fish, but they're a whole uh, ecosystem, a beautiful, amazing ecosystem. And um, this is uh, my friend Felicia. Um, wow, that's has nice. these amazing. I mean, even the, look at what's happened to the fish bowls. Remember what wow. fish bowls used to look like? Uh, Felicia McCauley uh, sets up these amazing little tiny reef tanks in a in a fish bowl that's just a couple of gallons. Fish bowls aren't just for goldfish. Yeah, that's anymore. right. <laughs> um, and uh, here's the I don't 
These are uh, these, this last sequence of uh, beautiful reef tanks, incidentally. Felicia sent me these. These are from a variety of different wow. aquariums from, from people in our hobby that have contributed these shots. It's, but, so, uh, it's so funny because that first picture, I remember it had to be in the 80s. That bleach coral was like, that was like the holy grail. You had to have the dead Acropora in the back. Like, like yeah. that was the sign of you were a real hobbyist if you had like what looked like a coral reef tank, but they was all bleached out. And we would take them out and scrub them every couple of months, you know, and put it back in there, you know. To yeah, come bleach them, set them out in the sun. and Yeah, and, leave uh, it out there in the barrel. <laughs> yeah, and now if there's a dead coral, people just they throw it away or they crush it up and put it in their calcium reactor. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the whole hobby has come such a long way. Um, and, and even, you know, simultaneously, of course, now um, anyone who keeps a reef tank is doing aquaculture too because these corals if if they're living they're growing and if they're growing just like a plant they're going to need to be trimmed back eventually so the this brought about the dawn of the frag swap and um <laughs> people uh you know like i said if, if you're keeping corals you're growing corals you're doing aquaculture but there's also aquaculture of course going on out in the wild oh he's the uh zoanthids of course you know oh. they're the, zoas. Uh, that's too many zoas to name anymore. I know. So yeah, I these are these are Colin Ford's zoas. Zoa, he just posted these. I, I borrowed Unbelievable. this picture from him. He's got this down at uh, Coral Morphologic, and they, these are all the rage right now. Some of the easiest corals to keep, and they're the price is going through. Oh, the, the price the demand is just amazing. I took my wife to the first, her first. I usually, my daughter and I have been going since we used to meet at the Pace University. I mean, me and my daughter used to go. I took my wife for the first time. I think four years ago and when she saw how much these corals were <laughs> she, she was like i know you're not paying that much for i mean some corals now are easily over a thousand dollars yeah and that was like before now with now with the you know some of the places being closed down due to you know the shutdown of somebody that prices have even jumped even higher yeah. Um, that's that's one of the great things about, you know, Biota, you know, you know, you mentioned Biota and they're one of the leaders in, you know, coming up with new ways of aquaculturing fish and clams, especially things like clams and coral and giving back to the hobby with some of the, you know, some of these these animals were disappearing from the reef. So it's been really important for us to put emphasis on aquaculture and and, and us as hobbyists doing more internal trades instead of pulling from the wild so you know companies organizations such as biota are really a, a big staple yeah and and another great thing that biota and 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 a lot of other groups that are doing coral propagation out in the wild um is that um they're they're simultaneously growing corals that that can be sold to the hobby but they're also creating habitat and, and most of them, biota included, a big part of what they produce are being planted back to rebuild reefs. And, um, and, and, and then there's a benefit that um, I think most people don't even think about. You know, I, I'm always defending aquaculture because it does uh, get a bad rap in some circles. Um, but one great thing about growing something like a coral, and it's, it's in many ways, the same benefits you get from growing oysters or even uh, kelp is that these animals, if you're growing them out in the wild, they're removing nutrients from the water. Mm. And those nutrients are things like carbon and nitrogen, things that we're concerned about building up. And so um, whether it's a, a filter feeding animal like a, like a clam or a scallop or an oyster, or whether it's something that's photosynthesizing like uh, an algae or whether it's something that's doing both like a coral as you grow them and remove them it's a net nutrient export and and at the same time all of those things most especially corals are also providing ha habitat for so many other animals out there so uh, there's a lot of good coming from that type of aquaculture growing things that are at a very low trophic level in the environment that are providing habitat and removing nutrients and um so, uh, and, and Biota is doing a lot of this with corals. They're growing and replanting corals. They're growing and 
replanting clams. Uh, a, a, a number of the fish species that they're working on are, you know, a, a certain, I haven't been there to, to their main um, facility in Palau, even though I've been a- Oh, Palau. I was getting ready to ask you where yeah. they're located. I've been a Biota employee for three years now. I, I think it's about time I go to Palau. Anyway, <laughs> Come on, put it on the list. It's a good list. <laughs> I'm sure they would send me. The, the problem is that, uh, like most of us, I'm a slave to my fish, and it's very hard to get away. Um, but anyway, yeah. this is uh, this is some of the staff at the Plow facility, um, where again, they're gr these I think these are clams here in this image, but they're doing uh, great stuff with fish and corals as well. And uh, it was so exciting to me to have the opportunity to not only come on board as a producer for Biota but also that nurtured a relationship between Biota and the college where I work right now. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but so let me just tell you the, the basics of, uh, of how Biota, what I know about Biota, like I said, I haven't been there, but they, their main facility, their main production facility is in Palau. Um, they also now have partnered with the Oceanic Institute in Hawaii and uh, the Oceanic Institute is a, is a, a marine uh, research um, branch of the Hawaii Pacific University. And they, have a, they do a tremendous amount of aquaculture research and development there. And so Biota um, has entered a partnership with them and um, has, um, uh, has a, a section of the, um, of their, research facility that's devoted to producing biota fish and there's some there's uh employees there of biota and um and uh they get the expertise of people at the oceanic institute and they've done some amazing things there too and um, then we have uh, our latest branch biota north carolina here's um tom bowling on the left and there's me and uh james uh and uh, Victoria and Chloe. Oh, Victoria is our intern this uh, semester. James and Chloe are both Biota employees now, and all of them are students of Carteret Community College. So, man, I wish they had programs like this when I was going to college. Yeah, I seriously, like, me too. Like so. facilities. I mean, oh, and, uh, man, so we've we've had students like James who was really interested in the hobby and moved here from um, the Midwest. To, to specifically to come to the college and learn about this and get into marine ornamental stuff. And then, and we've had a lot of other students that came in to learn about, you know, growing oysters or shrimp or something for food, and then got a look at all this aquarium stuff, seahorses and gramas and, and, and just kind of got sucked into it and now are, are getting involved. And you know, we, we have, uh, we get students involved with this project every semester and they just, they love it, and uh, and then we end up hiring out of uh, that pool of uh, students and and interns and volunteers as we grow, and we do definitely have plans to grow here. We're uh, slowly uh, chipping away at at taking every little bit of space we can inside this facility, and we already have the, the president of the college is on board with it and excited about it, and already talking about building the next building to help us grow. So. Um, a lot of exciting stuff happening. This is one, this is, uh, one small room that we rent. That, so Biota is renting this space, and this is primarily for our brood stock. Um, we have brood stock of some gramas in here and some uh, coral beauty angels and seahorses and a handful of other things. Um, and then we have a lot of shared space outside of here, our plankton culture areas and uh, larval rearing room. Um, and it's nice too because at a college where you're teaching aquaculture, you have students coming through and doing the labs, and you want to show them the whole process. But then you have breaks. You have a month long winter break, and you have a three month long summer break, and you have holidays, and you have periods where there's um, no reason to keep all of the stuff going. You can you can have someone maintaining some fish tanks, but in order to show them the whole process of producing phytoplankton and zooplankton larvae and um and and taking the fish through their whole life cycle and keeping the the broodstock in spawning condition 
you can't just turn that off and then ramp it up when the semester starts. And it's a lot of trouble to keep it going through those breaks. So by having Biota partnered with the college, we are keeping all of that stuff going all the time. So when students need to look at larval fish or hatching eggs or, um, you know, get their hands wet with raising phytoplankton, it's all going all the time. And that's a really great benefit to the students. Um, yeah. I'll just give a shout out to one of our high schools here in Brooklyn, Abraham Lincoln, which maintains an animal lab of about, about 40 or so tanks. And uh, I volunteer in the summer there and I work there throughout the year. And I, I see that we have interns and it is a lot of work. People do not realize, as you said, it doesn't shut down when the semester ends. They have to maintain those systems, cleaning tanks and changing water. I mean, we were checking air conditions last year because it got really hot. One of the air conditions broke and somebody actually brought in a, a unit. It is a lot of work. And just the fact that you're breeding fish there, that puts a, a extra <laughs> emphasis on visiting those systems. Uh, yeah. And, and, and speaking of high schools, another cool development that we've had this year is that uh, Dave Serino, our department chair, got a grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to um, get us sort of an outreach situation where we're teaching our introductory aquaculture course in a couple of area high schools. So we get we go there and we're, we're teaching in, in two different high schools and we're doing it. Um, we're doing it partly remotely. We're, we're in one one classroom at a time, but but broadcasting between the two. And they're taking uh, our introductory aquaculture course. And uh, it's it's fun, you know, talking to the students at the beginning of the semester and asking them what they're doing and why they're there. And almost all of them say, well, you know, I, I think marine life is cool and or or uh, this just sounded more fun than taking, you know, economics or, or whatever else they were going to take. Um, so there, a, a lot of them don't even know why they're there. But uh, last semester was the first semester we did this. And, and uh, one of the things that we do is we set up a little, each student sets up a very small tank, about a five gallon tank, just with a sponge filter in it. And, and they put a little something in it, a crab or a shrimp or a, a minnow or some, some little fish. And they cycle the tank and they watch the development of the tank through the semester. And um, at the end of the semester, you know, uh, this, these students, now are asking, can I take this home? Well, can, can you help me? Can you advise me on how to, I want to take my fish home? They get the bug snapper here. I want to take it home and grow it up. And uh, so I I ended up uh, letting them all take their sponge filters home and then advising them on you know where to get cheap tanks. And I, I you know I, I about half of the class turned into an instant marine aquarium hobbyist <laughs> that semester. And I thought, boy, this is great for our industry. I need to that is. This get some industry support in here and get some cool stuff donated to these classrooms because we're, we're churning out new hobbyists right here. Come on, all these companies out here. Come on, ZooMed. We need those low boy tanks. These um, are future fraggers. Imagine if they all had one coral to frag, like their project was to frag one coral, or breed one fish. Future um, aquaculturists out there. So, um, yeah. I, I, I think that uh, that's a no brainer, I think. And, you know, um, this, we feel like there's so many assaults against our hobby right now that the, the idea of getting more people into it is just, is really appealing. And, and there's really no better tool for teaching so many lessons in science and biology and physics. There's so many lessons to be learned. Last night, I met a couple um, that were English teachers, a husband and wife, they're both English teachers. And they both have aquariums in their classrooms that they incorporate into their curriculum in an English class. I don't even know how that works, but uh, it just goes to show there's a lot, a lot of great lessons that can come out of aquarium keeping. Um, and uh, a shout out to Felicia, incidentally, Felicia McCauley, who I'm sure all of you know. I saw um, this on Instagram. <laughs> one of my favorite uh, aquarium hobbyists of all time and such a great promoter of our industry and now an employee of biota too she handles all our social media oh wow and it's uh, terrific to have her as a co-worker and um and and helping to promote the stuff that we do and the fish that we raise um 
And so uh, I, I came into the picture and brought in a lot of what I have been working on the last few years, brought, brought some cool new fish to the table. But really, it's been an inspiration seeing what else has come out by of Biota out of Palau and Hawaii and fish again that were just some of these fish we like the Borbonius Antheus, not only as a fish that we never dreamed of even raising, I think this was raised for the first time by Karen Britton to give credit where credit is due. But um, but Biota picked up uh, the some broodstock and continued on and, and started producing these. But, you know, this is a deeper water fish that just a few years ago, not only did we not think it was something that could be raised, but it wasn't even obtainable like in the hobby, it was just too deep and too rare. Um, and this is a fish that now is, yeah, it's still expensive, but, but it's out there and being bred and, and, and it's, it's getting out and, you know, like all these crazy expensive fish, once they get into culture, the, the price does slowly come down too. Um, but, uh, the coral beauty, another, I always thought, I've always thought the coral beauty is maybe the single most underrated fish in the whole hobby because it's always been cheap and common, but so beautiful and an angel fish, just such a such a classy fish in every way and uh pretty hardy and and exquisite and um and i have to give kathy Leahy uh credit here for being the first one ever to raise this fish in captivity and also uh and and as far as i know she was the first person ever in the world to raise any species of angel fish 100 percent on cultured copepods. So these were these were copepods from Algagen, Parvocalinus from, from Algagen. And to me, this was a giant turning point. And uh, I'm thrilled that Biota has now picked up um, uh, production of these guys. And, and, and we've gotten some of their brood stock now at the North Carolina facility. And we have our first batch now just approaching metamorphosis. And that's something that's really so exciting for me to watch in person. I didn't know you guys were aquaculturing coral beauties, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, that, and now, would you consider them? That there's a big thing about coral beauties. Now, would you? Some say they're reef safe. Most say they're not reef safe. I wonder if there's any difference between aquacultured uh, coral beauties and wild caught ones. Well, it, it may be too soon to say in terms of, you know, what they're going to feed on in the tank. You know, my, my observation with aquacultured fish um, versus wild caught is that they're infinitely easier to pair and to keep together because so many of these fish are, are aggressive. And even if you are lucky enough to get a male and a female or an immature pair that could develop into a male and female, so often... Um, they just murder each other. You know, we watched, <laughs> we, we watched uh, back in the nineties, we watched, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of wild caught dotty backs murder each other. In yeah, the put them tanks we, <laughs> put them you know, together. <laughs> sometimes even after they were spawning, they would still kill each other. Um, but we also then saw a, a couple of generations in, they got more and more peaceful with each other. And so uh, that's, that's one nice thing that comes of it. And Another cool thing that's, how and the with... coral beauty, they what do they get about four inches, five inches? Yeah, yeah, yeah four or five inches. Um, but uh, some more cool things coming out of Biota in Palau right now is they've identi identified some really um awesome little tiny gobies. Some of them are, are gobies we haven't even seen in the trade before, you know. So often, so much of our history in wild collection is going after the big showy fish that a lot of little tiny gobies have been overlooked by the commercial collectors. Um, and now as we seek more and more reef safe fish and fish that are safe for tiny little fishbowl reef tanks like Felicia's, um, tiny, tiny pretty little gobies like this are uh, becoming very popular. And so these are fish that collectors never would have touched because the price was too low and they didn't notice them with all those tangs and butterfly fish swirling around. But now, that were specifically looking for fish to um, to propagate to to meet the needs of our evolving aquarium industry. We're we're you know rediscovering things like these beautiful little gobies. These are all um, uh, little nano 
uh, gobies that are gobies that are that are really perfectly suited to little nano tanks. Um, uh, a friend of ours, Noah, who lives up around uh, Greenville, um, uh, he goes on Instagram by Noah's Nanos, and he keeps uh, these beautiful little nano tanks. and And he he's like our biggest customer of these gobies. He has got so many beautiful pictures of these gobies. For all I know, some of these pictures might be his. Felicia sent them to me, but they, they might now, come from Noah. Now, um, I, I was wondering about that, because is it safe, or I really have, I'm always scared, like, uh, dealing with dotty bags when it gets to gobies. I got a big yellow clown goby, which is, like, one of my favorite right, right now. Is it safe to put multiple gobies in a tank, or I'm always afraid of that dotty bag syndrome? Well, I think it depends on the species, um, and and uh, I have to confess that I am I have never kept any of these three shown here. Um, I, you know, some of the Elicotinus species um, that we see in the Atlantic um, will live in a small harem, um, but I've also you know put three or four together and had only one survive after the fighting's over. So. Um, not 100% safe to do that with some species, but other species like the uh, Corophopterus personatus, the masked goby, like they form little little sort of loose schools or shoals and and uh, and they're beautiful and they kind of look like the goby on the right here, um, but they stay up in the water column and they live in small groups. And uh, I was just thinking that I need to get some of those and start breeding them again because I haven't, haven't raised that one in 25 years, but it's a, a terrific little reef fish that would go right along with these guys. Well, I had a little neon one very similar to that, and I learned very quickly that they're good jumpers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> surprised yes, me. Something so small, it jumped pretty high. It jumped out of there. Yeah. And it got through that little mesh, which surprised me. Um, another really great development that, uh, and it's funny, I had a, uh, a talk with, uh, these are some of Biota's clams, to throw the oh, those beautiful clam shot in there. Um, but another really cool development that I've, um, that I'm happy to see Biota getting into, and it's something that I, I talked to um, uh, my friend Avier Montalvo and, and Noel Heinsen to... Uh, really amazing breeders out there um, doing their own thing and going in their own directions. And, and, and um, like all of us, you know, we've spent years chasing our passion of breeding fish in captivity and especially trying to forge ahead with new species that haven't been raised before. And, and we talked about how difficult it is to, you know, to make a living at it. Um, and, and we were tossing around this idea of what if we started some kind of a um, cooperative where we get our, ourselves and a handful of other breeders and kind of try and pool our resources into one clearinghouse. And um, Biota is uh, doing a, a bit of that, and I'm really happy to see it. So some of the fish here are from Bali Aqua Rich, uh, another big producer. Um, this this uh, marine betta on the right is from Thomas Rower, who's a, he's a, an extreme hobbyist out west. He's a, he's an engineer, uh, I think. See something else. He does something else for a living. But like so many of us in this hobby, we make our living doing something, and we keep fish for fun, and then it gets to be a very serious hobby. And we you know we we kind of are walking this line between, you know, is this something, is this my whole life or is this just a hobby or, <laughs> you know, and, and so um, I know so many people growing corals and growing fish that love the process of raising the fish, but they really don't love the process of marketing and shipping and yeah. customer service and all of the other nonsense that's involved. And, and as I was saying before, I, I, um, the, this, this, the fact that there are so many little differences between the different species and between the different families makes it hard to scale up into mass production. There's around 400 species of marine fish in our industry and no hatchery can meet that demand. No five hatcheries can meet that demand. So you almost need to follow this model of 
um, bringing together different companies, different hatcheries, different breeders, and having a common clearinghouse. And uh, in the last couple of years, Biota has been providing an opportunity for people like Thomas and, and others. In fact, I'll say that if you um, read some amazing, awesome fish and, and post a picture or a video on Facebook of a whole tank full of them, um, you're probably going to get a, a, a message from someone at Biota in a few days saying, hey, would you be interested in uh, being our producer of that fish? And, and, and I think that's awesome. I think that's just amazing. And uh, it, it's great opportunities for people that love the process of producing. And um, and and it's and it's great for a company like Biota that is doing so much good and um, and and really needs to meet that demand of the huge variety that uh, that we have in our industry. I would Here's love another to example. Read those Pino beta. Urchin, you know, cleanup crews are so critical to you. Almost don't put an animal other than corals. You don't put an animal in a reef tank unless it's going to do a job. It's, it's not only become, is this reef safe? Now, I like this thing, it's pretty, but is it reef safe? It's, it's I'm only gonna put this in my tank if it's gonna do something. Is it I'll gonna eat algae? Is, is it gonna eat algae? Is it, a, is it gonna absorb phosphates? Is it gonna, <laughs> is it gonna eat Aptasia? Um, so you have, you know, a proper reef tank, there's a lot of planning that goes into every animal and the tuxedo urchin is a master of eating hair algae. Oh yeah, they're awesome. And um, so, there's uh, my friend Bill Catman uh, works at um, uh, now the name of the college is escaping me, but a college up in, in uh, Michigan, or, I think, um, uh, Augsburg University. Glad I thought of it. Bill Catman has a has a little program where he's teaching aquarium science and aquaculture to his students, and they're going through the motions of raising this and that, and they they hit on a great technique for mass producing these tuxedo urchins. And again, they don't, they don't want to have any part of sales and marketing and all that stuff. So um, we're, we're moving their urchins for them. We're giving them an outlet and a way to make some money and it's allowing us to expand the variety on our availability list. Um, so I, I, I love these trends that I'm seeing and um and and i love being a part of it and i know that we get we get really upset when we see things like this latest piece of legislation and i i have, you know i i certainly don't want to see it happen but i think we have to look at it realistically too and say you know as other things have shut down we've managed and and, you know, it was like the end of the world when Hawaii was shutting down collections. And most of us still hope it opens back up. But at the same time, um, that has added extra economic incentive to try even harder, to put more efforts into raising some of those endemic Hawaiian fish. And that process is already underway. You know, and, and it's one of the things that gave the economic incentive to, I mean, it was millions of dollars of investment to get these yellow tangs into production, something that a few years ago we never thought we would see. And the shutdown of Hawaii really helped boost that effort and and uh, allow it to pay off for the time being. And, um, and, and other Hawaiian endemics like Potter's Angels, you know, I, I already know multiple people, including us working on it. And it's only a matter of time before they're captive bred too. And, and we'll see better quality and, and less expensive potter's angels than we've seen in the past because of that. Um, this, this latest thing, this latest amendment to the Lacey Act, it sounds terrible and I hope it doesn't pass, but at the same time, it, it may provide some new opportunities for the world of captive culture. Um, and we also have to be a little introspective about this and say, uh, I, now I, I, I think it was Marco Rubio uh, of Florida who yeah. introduced this amendment. Yeah. And if you look at what's happened to South Florida, I mean, that's where the lionfish invasion started. If you yeah. go snorkeling in Boca Raton Inlet, you'll see an unbelievable variety of Pacific fish living there. 
if you walk down the street, you're going to see iguanas and, and you walk into the swamps around there and you're going to see pythons and it's turned into an environmental disaster. Mm. And we can't pretend that it wasn't the pet trade that is responsible for all of that. And so and just we have, to to our... some, we have to take some responsibility for creating a situation that made someone want to introduce this bill. I'm going to I'm going to jump in and just for people that aren't familiar with the legislation um, without going in too much um, legislation has been introduced in the last two years um, with an attempt to put a more imposed ban on keeping animals, not only in the aquarium trade, but uh, the goal of many of the private organizations, not so much public, but is to ban the keeping of many species of animals in zoos and public aquariums as well as research facilities and uh, even as pets. So um, there have been several um, additions admitted to kind of change the guidelines of some of these bills. But as we're discussing, you know, uh, in this presentation, what this legislation is going into is this, I believe it's uh, HR 45 something, but uh, you can look that up on Google. There's a lot of information in regards to the voting on these bills and they do greatly affect us. So you guys might want to take it among yourself to look in to your state legislation uh, as well as the federal legislation, because uh, if some of these bills get passed, you may not see any of these fish <laughs> in your local stores anymore. They, they've greatly increased the price of uh, fish like the yellow tang, which I've seen going for over $200 now, and other species are disappearing from your local shops as well. So uh, it is very important to educate yourself in the, the impact of these bills. Yeah, th yeah. this latest one is, is really, it's more about um, just making it very, very easy to uh, have any animal that could potentially be harmful environmentally or to humans um, be uh, just banned, banned altogether yeah. from any kind of trip, from import and from interstate travel, you know, and, and of course, some of the irony is, of course, dogs and cats are grandfathered in and will never be touched by but. this. And if you, if you look at how many people get killed by uh, dogs versus some of these other yeah. pets we're talking about. It's, it's, uh, there's no comparison, but... Um, well, we had it with yeah. the snakehead, too. I remember it was a big... Yeah, thing. remember what that? Snakeheads, and when they got too big, next you know you had a snakehead in your local park, yeah. and it could they were letting them loose, right? Yeah, it could decimate a population. There I mean, talks about them walking on the ground, that they can move and walk around from shimmy, I guess, like a snake or something, you know? Yeah. Well, welcoming our president, Steve Matas, has joined. How you doing, Todd? Uh, Hello, I Steve. Always, nice I to hear love your hearing voice. you talk. He jumped in. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I mean, we had, as a hobbyist, we have been a little irresponsible. I want to say a little, but there have been, uh, like any other trade, there have been the people that um, introduce invasive species into the local environment, even plants, even plants like kabamba. I know they're they're outlawed and. Uh, import and export and across the united states but uh, i had those in my pond one day by the end of the year they were wrapped around motors pumps everything was full of that <laughs> joe joe gave me a piece <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a big thing this coming year it's become a big political platform i don't marco marco did mention he did mention that as at the, one of the conventions last year and um, it's going to be something for us as hobbyists to take responsibility for and to be aware of. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I think um, that, uh, again, aside from writing letters to our representatives, you know, in, in, in protest of this uh, or, you know, um, I think that one thing we, we definitely need to do is just try to be more responsible going forward and, and, you know, and, and, and recognize that this came about because of irresponsible practices in our hobby and, and, and just own up to it and, and try to do better uh, so that these things don't get <laughs> introduced in the future. But uh, I, one, one great thing is that 
so much of what's being cultured already, uh, it, I think there's just no justification for listing it as injurious or, you know, or, or detrimental in any way. So hopefully, I mean, we're all afraid that, that, you know, everything except dogs and cats is just going to be blacklisted somehow. They're having what's called a whitelist. Everything, basically everything's going to be banned unless... You have to go on the black it, market to get fish. Unless it's on the white <laughs> list. I know. Yeah, this is how black markets are. But, <laughs> then again, my fish will jump in, in value. <laughs> but but I worth more than my car. Well, if they meet behind enough. stores and back alleys. <laughs> I, I do think we have some pretty good proactive organizations and people in this industry that will work to make sure that the things we care most about uh, that, that, that can be justified on that white list will get there, but, but let's hope that this doesn't even pass. So <laughs> anyway, um, but um, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to touch on, but I, I think I pretty much covered it all. And um, looking Looking at the picture with the angel, I, I've always loved them. And I've always wanted to put one in my reef. And you hear different stories. You hear people that put them in their reefs for years, never have a problem. And then I've heard put, put them in their reefs and they just wreak havoc on some of the, the larger, uh, the LPSs, hammers, things like that, you know. And I, and I love I love the fish. And like you said, it's, a, it's not an expensive fish. You find them all the time. It is now. Yeah, well, <laughs> lately, <laughs> lately, every, everything. I was in the fish store today. I just got a couple of fish actually, and it just everything has gone up. The guy in the fish was even telling me, he says, It's not that the fish have gone up so much, he's the shipping has gone up like crazy. Yeah, he's yeah, well, it's it, like it's, doubled. It's just, it's just, it's everything, you know, it's the groceries yeah, yeah. and the gas and everything. And else that's not, goes, so. Yeah, it's not just the fish. You go in a store, you go in a restaurant, you eat whatever you do now is just has gone up in price. Yeah. Well, luckily, I can't go out shopping because I'm stuck home with my fish all the time. <laughs> you got to send a fish shopping. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mexican uh, also, I, I do most of my fish shopping underwater, too. So <laughs> not, not that it's cheap to go out on a dive, but I, I do collect a lot of my own brood stock when I can oh, yeah? out on the water here. Um, we've, uh, yeah, we're not we're... That, that's another thing. That's another thing, because I was I was looking at. Um, some of the uh the dwarf killifish and some of the uh fish that we've actually bounced back in the hobby like a lot of things which were kind of disappearing or becoming harder and harder to find that we've started aquaculturing have started to bounce back um for a long time there was a big thing about cleaner fish you know like the yeah. cleaner fish which were really really big in the saltwater hobby uh, yeah. in the first years and you begin to see less and less and less of them have you guys uh looked into those as far as like trying to breed them it's been bred there and and uh and it's you know we're we're working on getting that underway i think part of the decline of the cleaner fish in the trade um was about the fact that they're they're not a hardy fish. They're not an yeah. easy fish to keep, and um, they're Feeding a beautiful them. fish. And it's awesome to watch them do their thing and and clean your other fish. Yep. But uh, so many people would be like, "Oh, I'm going to get a cleaner ras to help uh, combat the ick in my tank," which is a <laughs> terrible idea because yeah. it's one of the most prone fish to protozoan. <laughs> they get it. There is, you know, and and so it it's not going to control your ick. It's not going to control your parasites. Um, and and if you put one cleaner fish in uh, with two tangs and an angel fish, and it only has those three fish to clean, uh, <laughs> it's going to start pestering them too. These guys mm. in the wild are cleaning a steady line of fish coming through, um, mm. and and they and they're a delicate fish. You know, if you have a big, nice, healthy reef tank, it's an awesome fish to have in there. It's amazing mm -hmm. to watch it in this symbiosis with the other fish. It's pretty. It has a beautiful flowing swimming motion. It's always it's moving. Perfect. But but uh, like so many other fish, the Still average the hobbyist realized that this isn't a good fish for my 20-gallon tank. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't survive very well in a small tank like that. No. And yeah. so it just, it, you know, it, it, 
waned in popularity. I think that's the main reason we saw yeah. them decline. No, a lot of times you have problem problem with them eating too. They don't always take to food well. I've had yeah. several. Well, talk about a spe I was talking earlier about how Special specialized diet. the feeding is in a place like a coral reef. Mm. And and that's you know one of the ultimate specialized feeders right there. So it shouldn't be a surprise that a fish that has evolved to eat parasites and dead skin doesn't want to eat your tetramorphs. Flakes. Flakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Flakes. You know what? It's funny because I've had one that I just now switching tanks over. I lost him. I've had him about five years. He's a big cleaner ass. Nice. He would eat anything I put in the tank. And I was so I, all the fish I transferred from one tank to the next, I'd move my 180. He's the only one I lost. And oh, I was, he, so I, he went in the tank, he did die for the bottom and he never came out. Wow. And, and he's always so active. He's in front. Like I said, I throw flakes in there, I throw pellets in there. I could pretty much throw anything. And I throw a piece of meat in there. He'd probably eat it. You know? And, <laughs> and like I said, that, that was the longest I've ever had one. Cause I've had some, you put them in a the tank, they start, like I said, picking on the fish, cleaning and a short while they don't want to eat and they just stop eating, you know? Well, I, I would I would guess that in the next year or two you'll see these um, available captive bred. So and and, and then they bread, should yeah. also be uh, hardier and and more willing to accept different foods too. So don't lose you, hope you, on the cleaner races. You, you do see in more stores things laying cap captive bred. Whether they are or not, we don't know. You know, I bought a couple of bang guys maybe three months ago that were captive bred. They're fine. They'll only eat mice. They will not eat flakes. They will not eat pellets. But they're doing good. Then they say they're captive bread. You can't tell when you're going to the store. You're taking somebody's <laughs> word for it. You hope they're they're on the honor system a little bit, you know? Yeah. But uh you, you, but now, you do see more and more fish that like you said are captive bread in the last few years, you know, and that you never saw before. But now now if you get a new species now, like like now I'm now I'm talking to the potential breeders out there, <laughs> like when you get a new species, and it's not really looked at a lot in the saltwater hobby. I know a lot of freshwater hobbyists are willing to throw their their uh, chips into the hat. But now you want to, let's say, uh, I know that's a hard species, but like a, like this coral beauty. How would you tell, the, like, how would you go into trying to initially breed it? Like, how would I, like, I'm sorry, go, what, what was that? Like, how would you initiate? attempting to breed it i mean it's not like salt with a fish we're not so quick to go out and get sick of them and try to breed it yeah well everyone has a different approach you know if if you if you're near the um if you're near the ocean and you're near near where these things live uh most people will agree that the best thing to do is to go get a you know, go find a pair in the wild that's uh, already an established pair and an adult and, and get them right in the tank and mm. don't even treat them because um, they're, uh, you know, the, the, the treatment process is stressful. But um, if I'm here in the United States and I, I, I'm going to, my source of fish is a pet store, um, then I'm going to, usually what I'm going to do is get a couple of individuals that are immature mm. and run them through my normal quarantine treatment at least two weeks and I treat them with a combination of uh, some some kind of copper compound and formalin mm. um, and and then get them into their main tank and and let them grow into a pear or a harem um, you know and 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 that's assuming you know th that I have, you know, something that's a harem spawner or hermaphrodite, mm. um, but I'm, I like to, I like to always start with immature ones. I find that um, adult fish, even though, you know, some people have this idea that, well, if I, if I, if I get immature fish, it's going to take twice as long or five times as long before they're spawning. Immature fish will adapt better to aquarium life than large fish. I, I never start with large adults when I'm trying to put together a new brood stock. I let them get comfortable in the tank. I like to have them established in the tank before they reach sexual maturity. Okay. Um, let them grow into being a pair or a harem together. Um, These you know, also then, change sex then or as they're growing? Like, like clothes well, or? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the species I work with do. And some of them we don't even know, you know. How do you sex these? Out. What? How do you sex these? 
Can you tell I, I by can't looking? Sex any. I don't know what you know. There's a few fish that have very clear sexual dimorphism right. or sexual dichromatism, but it's more the exception than the rule. Most uh, of the fish I work with, I I can't tell one from another. So they just so you just have to watch them I, I like two, doing a mating. I mean, people will tell me you know that they can tell the difference between a male and female royal grama or neon goby or something, and I you know I'm sure they can. I can't. Leon Goby, they got good eyes. <laughs> I, I put I put a couple of small ones together and hope we get a pair. And I and I've had pretty good success doing that. And then a lot of other things that I work with, like the Liapropoma, are simultaneous hermaphrodites. Any two you put together ever will be a pair. So, so yeah. now I'm I'm assuming if these breed, the babies are, are very tiny. Yeah. So like I mean like I've seen ba babies on bang guys. What do you feed them that small? Well, Bangai Cardinal place. doesn't even have a larval stage. That's Bangai, one of the biggest yeah, Bangai's you can swimming. get out of a marine fish. So that you start them right on brine shrimp. And, really, uh, baby brine? And, 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 I got, and I got pellets. three spe I got three species of those cardinals now that I love. The spotted, the Bangai, and the pajama, and they're like amazing fish once they're paired up. Like they're when they paired up, they're yeah. obvious pair. <laughs> like it's I I had bang guys years ago and in my refugium every once in a while I would see these little tiny babies but they were so mine so small I'd never caught them or anything every once in a while I'd see them and then you wouldn't see them anymore you know oh. and I didn't know what to feed them well, what you to need do to, you need to cultivate a little bit more of a plankton population in your refugium because uh, a lot of people have good success having them just raise themselves in the yeah, refugium yeah. because again yeah. the, the bangai cardinal fish is one of the few marine aquarium fish in the trade that don't have a larval stage and so you you could if you wanted to uh get so a, when, you, when you say don't have a larva, in other words they eat as, as soon as they're born or they don't have to wait to uh, well they they hatch out of? and they're they're a juvenile they, they don't have the a larva a larva is a is a, like an embryonic stage in development that takes right. place outside of an egg or outside of a uterus so a larva comes out, it looks nothing like the adult and eats nothing like the adult. Mm -hmm. So like with, with things like the tangs and the angel fish and the, and the uh, basslets and things, they, they come out, they, they hatch out. They're not even eating anything for the first few days. And mm -hmm. then when they're ready to eat, it's something that is microscopically small and alive. It, it's a copepod nauplius or a ciliate or something. Uh, and that's why it's, that's why it's taken so many years to get these fish into production. Mm -hmm. So the Bangai cardinal fish, you know, it's like a guppy. It's, it's not quite yeah. a live bearer, but when a baby guppy comes out, it's just a mini guppy that yeah. eats the yeah, same yeah. things yeah. as yeah. an adult yeah. guppy eats. And that's not to say Bangai cardinal fish are easy because they're challenging. It's hard to, it's hard to separate those young right. from the adults and it's hard to get a really good healthy spawn. But if you do, they will start right in on brine shrimp or even on, okay. you know, TDO or some other little pelleted food Using cobra without, pods, without yeah. all the oh. larval rearing techniques that these other okay. fish require. And then the parents stop eating. So that's another problem. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> that's the another father problem. doesn't eat. While like he's the father's the not eating. And I'm like, I watch him change. They go through this color sequence and they almost look like they're fading. <laughs> like they lose all the color. And it's like, oh man, do, at what point do I set, you know? It's, yeah. it's a lot of respect that goes into, you know, facilities that breed on such a large scale. Even even I was looking at your slide with the, the big, huge tubs that these guys have in. It's very, like, susceptible to, like, changes. They have, they're outside. You know, you get the crazy weather, uh, weather yeah. uh, thing, a uh, heat wave or something like that. It's That's remarkable. True, yeah. And, and, and all these animals, they live in a very stable environment because they, they're subject to weather out there too, but they're Excuse in the minute. ocean. So, you know, a rainstorm barely touches the salinity out on a coral reef and a, and a, and a, a cold snap barely does anything to the temperature. So they, they live in a real stable environment. We put them in little tanks on land and, and all of a sudden conditions can change rapidly and they can't take that stress. And and uh, one of the things I was look I'm looking at Biota's website because I know I was looking at them a while ago. Now, are you familiar? They they actually sell a sustainable aquarium. 
Yeah, like like, yeah. like a package. Aquarium, so like yeah. I'm really like I didn't know that. I was just looking at the site, and you can actually go on the site. I think I posted it a while ago. I'm not spot, you know, I'm not promo on Pusher Biota, but um, like I was talking about breeding fish. They actually sell a package which has the tank equipment, a uh, uh, food supply. They give you a pair of fish. They give you the rock. Like for a person coming into the hobby, like if I'm talking about, I, I want to try to come into the hobby and breed fish. These guys actually sell a package with everything. <laughs> like, like it's, it's actually very impressive. And the, and the fact of the matter is you're getting something that, that is sustained. It's, it's, it's aquaculture at the facility. It's not impacting the environment. Um, that's pretty much as good for the hobby as you can get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I should get one of those tanks. I, you know, I should get them to, I should get some of those tanks in my classroom. I mean, I'm yeah. looking at it. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm really actually, uh, I just, I, I was, just, before we went on live, you know, I was I was telling Todd, you know, a, a friend of mine breeds fish, keeps freshwater fish, basement full of fish, great breeder. I could give him a fish I've had two years and he could breed it. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, but like a person really hesitant to go from freshwater to saltwater or vice versa to be able to go to a resource which is, you know, has the fish and that and and aquaculture fish, I find to be pretty much way hardier than wild caught fish only because the transportation and the and the shipping takes a lot of toll on the fish that's a really good way to get a person or, or a student or someone new to the hobby into the hobby yeah 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 when you think about how many people have you known over the years who spent a bunch of money and got into the hobby and then had you know two or three tank crashes and lost a lot of fish and said, forget it. I don't, I don't want to keep watching fish die. And they left the hobby. So, you know, uh, they, it, you know, I, there was, there was a time I felt where there were a lot of shady pet shop owners who almost, uh, set you up for failure to keep you coming back. And, and I think the whole industry has realized now that the best thing for the hobby is to set the new hobbyist up for success. And I, exactly. I think tanks like that uh, are great for that because it, it's, you know, to to, you know, go out and and have to research every different component for your very first tank where, you know, you're not yeah. trying to set up a big reef tank. You want to keep a couple of gobies or you want to keep some <laughs> exactly. party. But but there's still a lot of work that goes into, you know, which which filter and what size should I get and what kind of substrate is here to any of these packages that come where it's, it's, it's well overwhelming. Out. Yeah. And it could be it very intimidating. It, it's, it is it's setting you up for a, a good experience at the start. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Sorry. You got it. Yeah. I just, well, we got, I, just we, I just shared it here because I, you know, you, you, you're set up, easier for success with getting a full package than going out there most of the time when i mean if i had a dollar for every time i went to a local pet stop and i saw somebody just buying a bunch of stuff like you know we like we that have kept a long time you're so trying to fight the urge to say something but it's you know like, i, I you say know, something the, the worst part is when they buy the tank and the fish and, and the fish one day the fish are inside the tank Oh yeah. man, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> like I look at that fish, like you poor guy. <laughs> I mean, a fish store but, that used um, to be on Notion Avenue. He, when Nemo first came out, he said I was selling fish like crazy. But people would come in, take two fish, walk out, never say anything. Uh, one lady comes in, she goes, he goes, I keep killing them. She goes, what are you doing? So I put in a jar with kosher salt. <laughs> <laughs> kosher salt. <laughs> You have better luck so, keeping your filter fish, maybe. Yeah. So first, get the tank established. You know, but people are, are impatient. They want it to be there and beautiful, like you know, they see a nice tank. It doesn't happen that way. You know, it takes time. You know. And even, even, even buying a system, like even you know, ready-made system or or a package, there is an educational component that needs to come with it. I mean, yeah. I have gone to, I have gone get a, to get a book first. <laughs> I mean, I have gone to companies. Um, I've gone to, I remember Neptune, I remember Apex doing the controllers, you know, because people think that they buy one component and it's going to do everything. 
And I really, really, when they first came out, I I really pushed the, the idea of like, give a video, like we're in the age of technology, make a video saying step one, do this, or step two, you need to know that, you know, we're, we're trying to reinvent or simplify the way in which we educate the public so that we can avoid that goldfish ending up in Prospect Park or, you know, that Oscar ending up in the lake across the street because, you know, people see them so cute when they're, you know, they're this big. And six months later, when you got a fish this big, you know, you're like, oh, now I got, I got to get a bigger tank or I didn't know oh, it was going to do that. A little, you know? a little research before you buy. Like you don't go out and buy a red tail catfish and buy a 10 gallon tank, you know, but the fish store, if they'll sell you anything, they, most of them, they don't, you know, there's not many fish stores that will actually tell you, no, look, don't do this, do this and stuff. You're going to spend money. They're happy. And that's wrong. You know, you, because you don't think of the big picture, because if you teach that person the right way, maybe you'll get a second tank. Maybe you'll come back and buy more fish. You teach them the wrong way. The tank's in the pail two weeks later, you know? Yeah. Well, well they, I call think us and they call us I, and donate I, it to I, them. I think that your experience might be a little bit skewed by living in New York because, um, I grew up in New York, and that was my impression of pet stores everywhere. Yeah. And but but traveling around a little bit and going to speak at clubs around the country, there are some pockets of of really great hobbyist well, communities are. Where, are. that are yeah. that are led by by some terrific stores too. So uh, yeah, we've been in stores more... from from up the coast in Baltimore and Jersey and everything, yeah. and they were up plenty. Absolute fish, another one. He's he's oh, he did, that's not that type of fish store. He'll explain Shout it. He'll tell you what cat, fish, that. what it goes with, you know. Yeah. But you got to ask the questions, and some people just walk in and say, "Give me the tank, give me the fish, give me this," and they walk out, you know. Shout out to Pat at uh, Pat Donson at Absolutely Fish that actually Pat is a great has guy. Educational programs. I mean, you, you're you're absolutely right in mentioning. Larger cities do tend to focus more on the commercial, sure. where the smaller areas is usually a usually a vested hobbyist which runs right. the store, which he's more likely to yeah. say, "Okay, you want a system? Let me tell you the best way to start." You know, whereas you know it's not Timmy mm -hmm. that's working for the summer. Yeah. He's like, "How many fish you want? Ten of those? Okay, you know, there's a big difference, and that ends up putting us on the map." for legislation to come out to govern. Whereas well, if we could govern ourselves a little better, you know. You know, that's one of the things about our club, which we try to teach people and, and not to have a, a killing machine instead of have a fish tank, you know. Uh, there's just there's so many things to miss. It's just such a simple thing. Get a book, start off, ask some questions, do a little research first. Today, with the way things are online, it's nothing like when I was a kid. I'm, no. I'm Keeping fish nets, I'm 10 years old. I'm 60 now, 50 years ago. Yeah. There was nothing. You got a book once in a while, you know, you you figured it out, you know. Uh, now you can search everything online. Not everything yeah. online is great. Not you know, everything. There's a lot of bad stuff there too, but you can learn just about anything. Just I'm still people. pouring vodka in my tank, Steve. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. <laughs> there was a, like things come out in shifts, but uh, this is why I, 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 this is why I joined the club, first of all. I don't even know how many years it's been now. But, you know, to have people like Todd and, you know, to have people over the years to 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 focus on what's going on in the hobby and to mm -hmm. show us what we could get. Like some people don't know that you can get aquacultured fish. They don't know what aquacultured fish is. So um, this they don't is know there's a difference. There's a, they don't know if there's a difference even, you know, they they. You don't hear about because you don't see that in the store that much, unless it's freshwater, you know, guppies and things like that. You didn't, yeah. you didn't, you just didn't see a lot of aquaculture salt, salt water until recently. Yeah. You know, you're starting to see that now. Well, I had a, I had a guy. I walked, I walked into the store and when we, what used to be Thousand Island, I walked in and I literally bumped into a guy spinning. I think it was, uh, he was hitting the ten thousand dollar mark that day. He was actually buying thousands of dollars i looked at the guy and i don't know what he was selling but he had money to spend to, he was spending thousands of dollars everything was coming to the house and i said you know what you know what be good really help you to one book that showed them which fish would go together like the compatibility yeah. chart yeah. yeah. says yeah. no nah, i don't need that but you just spend ten thousand on the tag well, i hope he's spending that kind of money he's had fish before and he knows a little bit oh and then never had yeah. the fish it was the They're first not, tank it was his first tank he said it was his first tank, his first salt with a tank. But you know, you know one, one of the stories I like to tell Todd when I I worked for the city for years, and one day I'm in one lady's apartment and a tank 29 gallons, she got it empty. I said, Why is your tank empty? She goes, I can't keep, I can't keep fish, I keep killing them. I said, What are you doing? She goes, I fill it up every week, and every Saturday I wash it with palm olive. 
<laughs> oh, that's nice. amazing. Okay. So yeah. So you know, again, simple things, and and it, I guess it's simple just because we know and we've been doing it. But if somebody that doesn't know, doesn't realize that, never mind the soap, but it's not good to clean tanks all the yeah. time. You know, you need that bacteria in there. You need something in there, you know? And that's our that's our soapbox moment. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, great. I love the presentation. Was there anything else that you, you were going to mention about uh, biota? Probably, I don't know. You gotta, you gotta visit that. You gotta visit that facility. That I want you to day. visit that. I can't remember. I want you to visit that facility. You come on. You just, all these years, you got to go out there. I want to see a picture of you in the in the islands with your hand in that tub holding. I might not come back. <laughs> uh, North Carolina is a terrific place to be, and uh, I'm excited about what we're doing here. As we grow and and get, um, you know, can justify bringing on more manpower that will hopefully make it easier for me to get out of here for a few days. Here and there. That, that's where you are now, North Carolina, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You miss, you miss New York at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not even a little bit. <laughs> I'm good for you. I'm glad. I miss my friends there. There's, there is nothing else about New York. I miss. Right, right, right. Oh man. Because I'm well, the only one in my family just about still lives in New York. Everybody's moved all over the country, California, Florida, whatever. Me, me, I'm here. My, my dad's still here. That's it. I'm, re I'm ready to go to Florida just because there's better access to fish down there. Yeah. <laughs> That's I, sure. one of my I friends' kids are Go catch your own pythons. One of my friends' uh, kids are yeah. when, My wife will love that. When you leave, shut the lights, he tells me. Shut the lights. <laughs> well, it's, it's great having you, Todd. Always a good. pleasure yep. having you on here. Um, and shout out to doing great things at Biota. And doing great things in the classroom, producing those future aquaculturists of tomorrow. And and I hope that we hear one of these guys coming back and maybe they'll give a presentation one of these days. You will. I, I guarantee it. I, I get, you know, so many of my students keep in touch with me and I'm so proud of the things they're doing now, too. So uh, I'm, I'm sure they're. So they're actually they're, listening to you. <laughs> Some of them. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> they want to yeah, pass. They better be listening. A lot of my a lot of my former that's, students are putting me to shame these days, and it and it I, makes it warms my heart. So, but that's got to be satisfying too. It is. Yeah. Because you know you know the way they invested into it. They know they're listening. You know they're trying. You know they're not yeah. just going through the motions. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and and uh, you know it's 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 a great thing. I you know I'm working with the kids at the. You know, at the high school, and we got a great veterinary science uh, program over there. Some of these guys become vets and they come back. And I, you know, it's this is the way that we're going to change things by yeah. teaching them when they're young, sending them out there in the world, making that change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I went nice. through our one. Thank you, Todd. Loyal thank you, guys. Viewers. Always good well. talking to you. Yep. Stay well. Have a great night. You too. And yes, sir. We're going to call it a night for everybody that signed it. Once again, we are trying hard, 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 hard to meet in person. So if you're not a subscriber, click the subscribe button now, YouTube, and subscribe to us on Facebook because we'll <laughs> be letting you know, God willing, we can meet next month in March if everything falls into place. Right, Look, we're, trying, we're trying. We're trying. We're trying, so we're you're trying, gonna hopefully know. not too much longer, and we can get something going. And I'm sure all you guys miss. I know we miss having the meetings and stuff. And 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 on that note, good night, everybody. Be good to each other, and don't wash those tanks out with palm olive, will you? <laughs> <laughs> good night. Right. Thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. Take care.